my talk uh, has a broad and admittedly somewhat grandiose uh, title. It's driven by a core idea that the principal challenges that the United States faces with respect to water infrastructure are not technical and they're not environmental. There are problems, to be sure, I don't want to be Pollyanna about things, but in, in, because new contaminants, new hazards, new environmental challenges are always appearing. But thanks to the work of scientists and engineers, we've gotten very good at identifying and, and, uh, and, and addressing threats to water quality. Uh, we're very good at developing infrastructure and technological solutions. We're very good at developing and engineering processes. I'd argue that the real barriers to addressing our water infrastructure challenges are political. The problems we face can be traced to the crazy quilt of institutions that govern, operate, and regulate water utilities in the United States. So I'm going to do something a little bit odd, a little uncomfortable, a little outside the box for an academic, and that is I'm going to offer a set of systemic reforms to the institutions that govern water infrastructure in the United States. These uh, observations, my observations today, are informed by voluminous uh, empirical research, both my own and others, as well as 22 years of experience uh, working with local governments here and there around the country and city halls and treatment plants to try to improve things. Oh, it just occurred to me, I don't think I unmuted my mic. There we go. Good. Ah, that's better. So here's where we're going. I'm going to start by giving some context to the extraordinary moment we're living in and what it might mean for water, for the water sector. And then I'm going to move to my five-part outline for reforms to the American water uh, sector, which I have labeled, as you see, uh, shrink to grow, New Jersey plus Wisconsin, uh, smart systems, smart people, and then the color of water. I'll close with a few remarks on uh, the way forward. I'm going to be going pretty fast. Um, and, and that's because I've only got an hour, or now not even an hour, I've got 40 minutes to try to save the entire US water uh, system. So I'm going to have to go kind of fast. My students sometimes say that my lectures are like drinking from a fire hose. So get ready for that. I apologize in advance, but on the other hand, you will not have any quizzes or exams later. Uh, so you, you've got that going for you. Uh, one other quick note to clarify on language. I'm going to use the word water today, water infrastructure, water, water, water. When I say that, please know that I'm referring, unless I say uh, explicitly otherwise, I'm referring to water, uh, wastewater and sewer systems, and uh, urban stormwater systems all together. It would be uh, uh, sort of awkward to say that over and over, so I'm just going to say water. Please know that I'm talking about all of, all of those systems at once, though. Okay. Let's start by setting the stage. We are at an extraordinary moment for water infrastructure in the United States. For the first time in a generation, water infrastructure is on the national political agenda. Across the country, people are thinking about it, they're talking about it, they're working on it. The country faces daunting replacement costs for aging infrastructure, and at the same time, there has been a steep decline in federal funding, federal grant support for water infrastructure. Federal uh, programs supported the systems that serve much of the United States back in the 1970s and the 1980s with 90% matches, 90 cents on the dollar of infrastructure back in the 70s and early 80s was paid for by Uncle Sam under the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Now most water systems in urban areas in the United States are designed with 40 to 50 year lifespans. Well, guess how many years it's been since those systems were built. I think about this a lot because I was born the same year as the Clean Water Act. I'm always very aware of how old these systems are. In some ways, I'm aging with them. Uh, new, we'll have much more to say about uh, systems breaking down, these systems, not mine, uh, in, in a few minutes. New contaminants and threats to health are forcing new regulations all the time. Uh, treatment, new treatments to, to address those contaminants are expensive. And uh, some communities are really struggling with the costs of maintaining and upgrading those systems, especially smaller communities, rural communities, or in some cases, even larger communities with stagnant or declining populations. The American Water Works Association estimates that the US faces roughly a trillion dollars in maintenance and upgrade backlogs over the next 25 years just in drinking water, a trillion dollars over the next 25 years. So there is an enormous overdue infrastructure bill on America's desk, and that is driving attention to this topic. But there's something else going on, too. 
This is now the face of water infrastructure in America. Flint has changed the way Americans everywhere think about water infrastructure. It is difficult to overstate just how much Flint has changed the national conversation on drinking water and uh, on water infrastructure generally. Those of us who have been working on water for a long time, uh, for those of us who have been working on it a long time, this is really extraordinary. You ask a random American about water in the United States, they're likely to talk about Flint. Flint is not the first, it's not the worst, it's not the biggest uh, drinking water contamination problem in recent years, but it is the one that caught the public imagination and put the spotlight on water infrastructure. I want to share with you some especially interesting little analysis I did right here in Rhode Island. Uh, as you may be aware, some of you may be aware, Providence has had uh, severe lead contamination in its drinking water supply. That's been known now for over 20 years. Providence has, uh, in, the institutional story in Providence is far different from what it is in Flint, but the lead contamination is in some ways just as bad, perhaps uh, worse in some ways. Now Providence's water managers have known about that problem, and back in 2014, they uh, started a program that offered dr uh, drinking water testing to its customers. If you wanted to have your, your uh, drinking water tested, the, the, gov the, excuse me, the, the water utility would provide that service. I want to show you a graph of participation during the first two years of that program. Are we going up here? There we go. As you can see, uh, the, utility, uh, the utility mails out uh, notices about this program every year in its May and June billing cycle, and so you get a, a, a big bump, in, a little bump in, in participation in June and July every year. Now, for the first two years of this program, participation averaged about five customers per month uh, in, in this program. Then something happened in January of 2016, or excuse me, the spring of 2016. What happened? The Flint water crisis happened. So a disaster 700 miles away in Flint caused people, the people of Providence to start thinking differently about their own drinking water supplies. This is the average Google News index value for the Flint water crisis. These are values taken from Rhode Island. Okay, so these are people who are searching, about, uh, searching for information on Google about the Flint water crisis in Rhode Island. And we see, uh, that, you know, this might be a cause and effect relationship, maybe. Uh, it certainly seems as if uh, the Flint water crisis changed the relationship between uh, the utility and the customers in as far away as Providence. Flint water crisis, I, I like to describe as the Cuyahoga River fire of our generation. Forty years ago, in fact, 40 years ago this year, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Three years after the Cuyahoga River fire in Cleveland, we got the Clean Water Act. Now, that's a commonly known story, but what people sometimes forget is that when the Cuyahoga River caught fire in 1969, it was the 12th time the river had caught fire. It had caught fire five times in the previous decade alone. So what was it in 19, about 1969 fire that made people pay attention? Well, the truth is, we don't really know. But it did, it, it caught the public imagination nationally and it drove a significant policy change because it changed the way that Americans thought about water pollution. Because of Flint, we are in a similar moment right now. But of course, Flint isn't just about lead contamination. It's also about bureaucratic organizations, it's about partisan politics, and most of all, it's about race and poverty. There's a growing recognition that water infrastructure is an environmental justice issue in the United States, and that has changed the political coalition that, that forms around uh, water infrastructure. Over the past three years, hardly a day has gone by, or at least a week, without a major American news outlet running a story on water. Uh, and I can tell you, as somebody who's been working on the water for a long time, that's weird. We're not used to this kind of attention. Last year, Gavin Newsom, California, and Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan both made water infrastructure centerpieces of their successful gubernatorial campaigns. Water figured prominently in the White House's infrastructure plan, it was published early last year. Last fall, President Trump signed a major water infrastructure bill, and that's notable if only because transportation and energy usually get all the love in federal infrastructure money, where it's, an, it's unusual for water to get that kind of attention. Last year, Senator Harris of California introduced legislation aimed at uh, addressing water affordability. She now, of course, has higher ambitions. 
speaking of ambitious politicians, Beto O'Rourke made his, one of his very first campaign stops in Flint, Michigan, where he talked about, of course, water infrastructure. Now, none of these people is an environmental engineer. None of these people is a renowned water geek. You don't have to be a political scientist to know that when some, something is happening, when ambitious politicians start flocking to an issue. All that portends something. There is a growing consensus that existing infrastructure funding and governance arrangements are failing. As recently as two years ago, I dismissed out of hand the idea that the federal government would ever channel trillion dollars to the water sector. But something seems to have shifted. Just last month, congressional leaders and the president began sketching out a $2 trillion infrastructure plan, a big chunk of which would have gone to the water sector. Now, those talks have broken down, but uh, if you followed the news, you know that. Uh, but the fact that they were even happening suggests that we may be uh, an election away, maybe even closer, to a major federal investment in water infrastructure. So whether it's next year or two years from now, it looks like Washington may soon be sending an awful lot of money to water systems. That is music to the ears of a lot of activists who think that a federal infusion of money is what's needed to address America's infrastructure woes. But that is an easy narrative that misses some of the systemic problems that plague water systems in the United States. Federal funding package that fails to address and change the institutions that got us into this mess would be a wasted opportunity. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit relieved when those talks at the White House broke down because the breakdown in talks gives us an opportunity to pause, step back, think carefully and systemically about how we want to address uh, the institutions of water infrastructure in America. So rather than simply shoveling buckets of money at local water systems, a big federal funding package ought to be used as a leverage to reform the institutions that govern water infrastructure. That is actually what Congress did 50 years ago. When lamenting that loss of federal funding we saw a few minutes ago, back in the 1980s, people forget why Congress spent all that money on water systems in the first place back in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, the 1972 Clean Water Act, 74 Safe Drinking Water Act, sent money to local governments as part of an implicit quid pro quo. The federal government was imposing sweeping, costly new regulations on, on American water systems, and so Uncle Sam sent along a whole bunch of money to help that medicine go down a little bit more easily. It wasn't just federal funding. It was federal leverage to drive a major policy change. We need similar leverage today. If Uncle Sam's going to send hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars, then just as in the 1970s, it ought to be used to leverage systemic reforms. So with that preamble, I'm going to lay out a set of five reforms that I think ought to accompany any big federal program. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to do things a little bit backward. Rather than explaining all the problems and then offering solutions, I'm going to organize things by solution and then talk about the problems that each solution is meant to solve. All five of these are important, but I'm going to spend most of my time on the first two. I'm going to go relatively quickly through the last three. I want to emphasize this list isn't exhaustive. There are lots of other things that we can do uh, with water, and this is going to have to be at a very high sort of 30,000 foot level. I'm going to breeze by a lot of important detail. The important thing is to think of these five reforms as a framework that changes, that, that changes the, the institutional incentives that drive water infrastructure investments in the United States. Each proposal that I'm going to talk about is rooted in empirical research, both my own, other people's research. I'm not just making up any of these. None of this is hot takes, right? Everything is very considered. And each part is ambitious. But each part is also technically, and I believe politically, feasible. So that's a very long wind-up. I hope the pitch is as good as the wind-up. So the first proposal uh, to reform the water sector is that it has to shrink in order to grow, or perhaps grow in order to shrink, depending on how you want to look at it. I put this one first because it is the single most refor important reform. It is the most badly needed. And without this one, the rest of them probably don't work. So this is the single biggest one. So what do I mean to shrink to grow? Well, to put simply, there are way too many water systems in the United States. Way, way too many. One of the things I think that surprises newcomers to the American water sector is just how many 
water utilities there are. The energy sector, I think, is a, is a useful contrast. In the United States, there are about 3,200 electrical utilities. Collectively, they, serve, they, they operate about 7,000 uh, power plants. Uh, there are about uh, 6,000, or excuse me, 7,800, about 7,800 natural gas utilities in the United States. By contrast, there are about 50,000 community water systems in the United States, 50,000. Every one of those systems has to be managed, monitored, and regulated by EPA. And more than uh, 50, uh, excuse me, more than 100 state, territorial, and tribal bureaucracies of different types. 50,000 water systems. Any serious uh, attempt to address America's water infrastructure problems has to grapple with this graph and the, all the implications that follow from it. Moreover, it turns out that 80% of those, about 40,000 of the 50,000 systems are very, very small. They serve populations of fewer than 3,300. A little more than half of the U.S. population gets its water from the largest thousand water systems. The small systems serve less than 10% of the U.S. population, but they compose 80% of the total systems. It is difficult to overestimate and overstate the effects of that extreme fragmentation of the water sector. Virtually every aspect of the American water sector is worse because there are so many small systems. There are so many systems in general and so many tiny ones that lack the capacity to operate effectively. America's water problems aren't only in small systems. I don't want to overstate it in that sense. There are certainly plenty of medium and large systems that also have problems, but it is true, there's no question that small systems are disproportionately plagued by the hardest problems. This graph shows the relationship between uh, system size and Safe Drinking Water Act violations. These are health violations, so that indicates exceedances of contaminant limits or bad treatment technique, bad treatment technology. Vertical axis is the number of health violations. The horizontal there is, uh, is population served by the utility as plotted on a logarithmic scale, so you can see the whole range of size in the United States. As you can see, violations are very strongly related to system size. In small systems, it is not uncommon at all for utilities to have uh, several violations, sometimes dozens, sometimes hundreds, every year, perennially. To add insult to injury, water is also more expensive in small systems. Small systems pay more for capital, they have fewer customers to share fixed costs, they're more vulnerable to financial fluctuations. I've done quite a bit of research on water affordability in the U.S., and uh, this graph comes out of a study that I published earlier this year. This is the relationship between the price of basic monthly water and sewer service for a family of four, about 6,000 gallons per month, expressed in hours of labor required at the local minimum wage. And as you can see, water's most expensive in small systems, and it gets cheaper as the system grows. So with respect to both quality and price, there's very strong evidence of an economy of scale with water systems. But there's another less obvious in some ways more pernicious problem with all these little systems, and that is they're very, very hard to regulate. 50,000 water systems means 50,000 sites to visit, 50,000 files to maintain, 50,000 sets of records to track. One of the well-kept secrets of the water sector I'm about to spill, is that small systems uh, actually are held to different standards from large systems. Theoretically, the Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act are supposed to apply everywhere, but it's not just that, that enforcement is lax with small system. Agencies act, that the agencies that regulate water quality actually apply lower standards to all of those small systems. There are different rules that apply to small systems. Small systems are much more likely to succeed in their appeals and to get variances from environmental regulators. So rather than, and now there, there is a good intention, right? There's a good intention behind that lax rulemaking. The, the good intention that led to that particular hell is that small systems lack capacity. They often lack the organizational and human capacity to comply with the rules. Sometimes they lack the financial capacity. So rather than continuously hitting small systems with, with fines and violations, regulators either look the other way or they loosen the rules for the small systems. So the correlation we see between size and, and violations actually grossly underestimates the real relationship between system size and water quality. Now those problems are widely recognized. 
I've, I've showed you some of my own research I've conducted with David Switzer at the University of Missouri, but there are probably a dozen other studies that show exactly the same relationship. The obvious solution is to reduce the number of systems through consolidation. We gotta shrink the sector in order to grow, or we need to grow utilities in order to shrink the size of the sector. Now that can happen when multiple small systems merge into one. It can happen when a large utility takes over a smaller one. It can, uh, it can happen when an investor-owned firm, a private water utility, takes over a public utility or a smaller private utility. Some state governments, including California and Connecticut, have taken steps to encourage exactly this consolidation because they see exactly the same patterns that I see. But consolidation's hard. It's hard in a lot of ways. Often there's fierce political resistance to consolidation, either from communities that fear a loss of local control uh, or from small system staff who fear losing their jobs. Sometimes it's difficult to find a large utility that's willing to take on the responsibility for a small failing system. Sometimes it's just hard to navigate the legal and technical complexities of all of that kind of consolidation. It's, a, it's also just a very controversial issue. I'm going to be going to the uh, AWWA annual conference next week, and I can tell you uh, consolidation is a dirty word. It's likely to get you in trouble in certain, certain circles. In, in, in four years after passing a law to encourage consolidation in California, very little consolidation has actually happened. So in order to make consolidation work, we need tastier carrots and we need bigger sticks. So proposal number one is to reduce the number of community water systems by an order of magnitude by 2030. Federal funding for small systems ought to be contingent on consolidation. Yes, let's spend money to fix failing systems, but only if those fixes put those systems on a path to sustainable, uh, sustainable operation, self-sufficiency. Consolidation is the single best path to that goal. That means physical integration where it's feasible, but small systems can also be folded into large organizations. So you have sy systems that are physically separated but, uh, or operated as a single organization. And finally, as a corollary to that proposal, we gotta have one rule book. No more bending or loosening the rules for failing small systems. We have to have a single set of regulations that apply to all utilities. Now I cannot stress this enough. Shrinking the number of utilities is the single best thing we can do to improve water infrastructure in America. Second most important thing we can do is to change the way that public officials think about investing in water systems. To do, the, to do that, we should follow the leads of New Jersey and Wisconsin. These two states do some things with, that change the local politics of infrastructure investment. Another way in which uh, water is different from the energy sector is that about 80% of, uh, excuse me, 85% of Americans get their drinking water service from a local government. About 15% of Americans get their service from a private uh, firm. That's almost exactly the opposite of the energy sector. Most Americans get their electricity from a private company, and 15% get, get, uh, get it from a public agency. Now, ownership is crucial because different institutions govern private and public utilities. They operate under very different kinds of structures. Let's start with the private sector. Private utilities of all kinds, whether they're energy, water, telecom, whatever, they are operated by corporate managers, but they're natural monopolies. So we can't allow them to just set their prices whatever they want. Instead, prices are controlled by state public utilities commissions. State public utilities commissions only govern private utilities, with one exception I'll get to in just a moment. Public utilities commissions, or PUCs, allow private utilities to set their prices as a function of their investments in infrastructure. The more capital the, the utility invests, the more money it's allowed to charge its customers. That actually creates a weird kind of incentive to overinvest in systems. If I get more money when I invest more in the system, then I have all kinds of incentives to invest more in the system so I get more rate revenue out of my customers. So much of what the PUC does is scrutinize all those investments to make sure that the, you know, that the private system isn't overinvesting and really kind of gouging their customers. But remember, that's only 15% of the water sector. The other 85% of the water sector is governed by local city governments. Cities, towns, counties, villages, special districts. These systems are operated by local bureaucrats and the investment and pricing decisions are made by local elected officials. So for all the talk about federal funding, 
Water infrastructure is really a matter of local politics much more than it is of federal politics. And unfortunately, the local politics, the local political dynamics are very often unkind to water infrastructure for the simple reason that the price of water is much more visible than the quality of water. Most contaminants in water are invisible to most of us. Unless your water is egregiously bad, like it's literally dirty, you can't see through, it's opaque. Unless it's extremely bad or you have a water service outage, you probably don't have a very good idea of how good or bad the water quality is. Unless you can see it, smell it, or taste it, you have very little idea about the quality of the water unless you are a specialist. Unlike, say, transportation infrastructure, road and bridge, you can see it. You can get a good sense of how, 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 what, how good a condition it's in. Water systems, sewer systems, are literally buried. They are out of sight. I can't see how good my water system is, but my price, the price of water, is highly visible. I may not know how good the water is, but I sure know what I pay for it every month because I get a bill, right? And I look at that bill and I have to pay that bill. As in all things, people generally like high quality and they like low prices, but prices are much more visible than quality. Now, suppose I'm an elected official. I like a lot of elected officials. I want people to like me. I don't want them to yell at me. I would like to get reelected. If I make decisions that maintain or improve water quality, well, that's good, but my voters may not recognize any improvement. If water quality improvement causes the prices to increase, they're going to notice that, and they're going to be unhappy. So for local officials, maximizing water quality is a loser. It's a political loser. Minimizing prices is a political winner. So the smart play is to keep prices low. That means keeping costs low, keeping infrastructure investment low, deferring maintenance for as long as possible. Politicians aren't looking to take credit for good water systems. They're trying to avoid blame for rate increases. They like to show how low their rates are compared with all of their neighbors. They like to brag about how long it's been since they had a rate increase. The danger, of course, is that something catastrophic could happen. But if I'm an elected official, the odds that the Flint water crisis is going to happen on my watch, pretty small. It's my successor's problem, not mine. I'll just put it off, put it off, put it off, let a later politician deal with the problem. That way, I can avoid blame. But blame avoidance isn't a very good motivator for water infrastructure investments. So a big part of why all those facilities built back in the 70s and 80s are crumbling is this dynamic. The goal when, when Uncle Sam paid for all those systems in the 70s and 80s wasn't, the, wasn't for the federal government to own and operate America's water infrastructure. The goal was to help local governments and local utilities kind of get up, get up the curve, get the, the new environmental regulations into place, and comply. Local governments were then supposed to take on uh, the responsibility for maintenance and upkeep and upgrades over time, and in too many cases, the political dynamics I just described have led local officials to run their systems to failure. Politicians don't neglect water systems because they're stupid. They neglect them because they're smart. It's because they're responsive to local political dynamics. Which brings us to New Jersey. Back in 2017, New Jersey passed something called the Water Quality Accountability Act. It's a sweeping new law that requires local utilities to develop asset management plans, report on infrastructure conditions and performance, and reinvest adequately in their systems. Now, that law is just beginning to take effect this year. At first blush, it might look like a bunch of narrow, technocratic little rules. But it's really much more, not because of the rules themselves, but because of the way that those rules can generate data to change the way that water systems are perceived. It's really very easy to track water, the molecule. It's very difficult to track infrastructure flows, money, policies. What the New Jersey Water Quality Accountability Act will do is allow us to do that. Trace the full nexus between infrastructure investment, affordability, public health, environmental quality, and economic growth. Making all those data transparent can help make water quality at least a little bit more visible, maybe a lot more visible. Make water quality, hopefully, uh, I'll put water quality on a level where it can hopefully compete with price for the public's attention. We can make infrastructure a credit claiming game again instead of just a blame avoidance game. Meanwhile, a thousand miles away in Wisconsin, 
is a regulatory system that's a very nice complement to the New Jersey approach. Now, all 50 states have public utilities commissions. In, uh, in Wisconsin, it's called the Public Services Commission, PSC. In all of the other states, however, the P PUCs only apply to private utilities. In Wisconsin, Wisconsin's the only state where both public and private systems have to go through PSC uh, rate review. Now, the traditional role of the PUC, in this case PSC, is to try to control or reduce investments over, you know, try to prevent overinvestment in water systems in, in, and in order to, uh, to uh, guard against overpricing. In the case of local water infrastructure, the case in Wisconsin, the PSC theoretically can also guard against underpricing. The PSC says, gosh, you know, your local utility hasn't raised its rates in 11 years. Are you sure you are making responsible management and, uh, and upgrades? Uh, if not, the PSC is theoretically empowered to force utilities to raise their rates in order to make adequate investments. So proposal number two is to require comprehensive asset management and performance reporting, as in New Jersey, and to follow Wisconsin's lead by applying PUC review to local government utilities, just as they do for private sector utilities. Per put together, these two proposals would change the political incentives for local officials to invest in their systems, upgrade them when they need to be. Speaking of upgrades, it is time for a giant leap ahead in infrastructure with the deployment of smart systems. And the smart system is a catch-all phrase I'm going to use to capture the application of information technology to water systems. Uh, many of America's water systems, maybe most of them, are operating on 19th and, and uh, mid-20th century technology. Often uh, the first time we're aware of a problem with a system is when the water main break happens down, uh, downtown. Every week or two there's a story in a local newspaper somewhere that shows some relic from the 19th or early, maybe even the 18th century uh, a water utility uh, uh, that shows just how antiquated our systems are. Old pipes lose enormous volumes of water to leakage and it can cause sewer overflows during rainy weather. A lot of utilities have been working hard to try to, to get a hold of these systems, but it, the truth is a lot of America's water utilities have no idea the conditions of the systems that they operate. The only time they know that there's a wood stave pipe, uh, pipe under downtown is when it bursts and they have to go fix it. So we need smarter systems. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I'm going to go on quickly because I understand there's going to be a whole lecture about the internet of water uh, at the end of the week. So I'm just going to leave it at, at this. We need smarter systems. We need microsensors and telemetry to give real-time information for an entire utility, autonomous robots that can do underground work of the system inspection and repair without the danger and cost of putting people underground, data systems that can use to model and predict disruptions and crises before they happen. I have to share this one because it's so fun. There are now systems that allow, that use satellite technology. The same technology that's used to detect water on Mars and other planets can be used to detect leaks in water utilities in the United States. And you can actually get a little, a little app for your smartphone that shows you where the leak is based on the imaging that the, that the satellite does. This stuff's so cool. But little tiny systems that serve 2,000 people are not deploying this technology. It's not a surprise that the bigger, more sophisticated systems are the ones that are doing smart systems. So proposal three is to support the development and deployment of new technology, smart system technology in the water sector. If, we're, if Uncle Sam is going to invest billions or a trillion dollars in water systems, let's not build 19th century systems. Let's build 21st and 22nd century systems. Along with smart systems, we need smart people. Once upon a time, water system operations was a semi-skilled job. You have strong back, you can wield a shovel, turn a wrench, drive a backhoe, you can be a water operator. Until recently, it wasn't unusual for water operators to be semi-literate with little or no scientific training at all. That is no longer true. Today, a water operations job is a highly skilled job. Regulations are complex. Technology is complex. Operators have to have a decent working understanding of physics, chemistry, and biology. They have to have a reasonable, reasonably good working knowledge and ability with math. They have to be able to communicate with management. They have to be communicate with the public sometimes. In short, today's water operator has to be highly skilled and fairly well educated. But highly skilled operators are in short supply, and human capital is not evenly distributed around the country. 
Training up a utility operator takes a lot of time. And in parts of the United States, there's, there's not sufficient educated workforce locally to even train up utilities. I'm going to show you some results of a, a study, again, I did with David Switzer a couple years ago. I looked at the relationship between human capital and the labor force and a Safe Drinking Water Act compliance. We found a strong relationship between labor force education and, work, and water quality. Uh, you can see here that the blue areas are, are good uh, compliance, uh, the red areas are bad compliance, and we looked at the, the labor market education level, and we looked at the size of the utility. The results are pretty clear. Uh, we found that strong relationship. Larger organizations are more effective in leverager, leveraging human capital, and the reason's pretty clear. Suppose you're a smart, ambitious person and you're interested in a water career. You go to work for your local water utility, if it's a little one, there might only be a dozen employees. What's your path to advancement? You've got to wait for someone to leave the organization before you get to advance. It's no wonder that larger organizations pro can attract and retain better employees. That's just another reason large systems are better. I've actually heard directly from at least one utility manager who told me that sometimes utilities deliberately underinvest. They choose not to train their employees with the latest technology because they're worried that if they do, those employees will leave. You want to talk about your perverse incentives. We need to do much, much better. Making matters worse, each state has different training uh, and licensing regimes. There are separate licensing regimes for water and sewer, separate for treatment, separate for fields, separate for uh, collection and distribution systems. The patchwork is confusing and frustrating. All of that regulation is sand in the gears for the water utility labor force make it difficult for smart, ambitious people to enter and develop a career in the water sector. So proposal four is to invest in workforce development and create national certification standards, liberalize that labor market, and, uh, and, and invest in developing human capital. Now, that is not a particularly new idea. With the Clean Water Act, people tend to focus on the pollution controls with good reasons, but Title I of the 72 Clean Water Act was investment in research and human capital. People in the water sector sometimes talk about the class of 72, engineers who are in the class of 72, because those are people who are all trained under programs that were funded through state uh, land grant universities funded by the Clean Water Act. So this is not a particularly revolutionary idea. We just need a similar investment today to build the next generation of human capital in water, which brings us to the last proposal that I'm calling the color of water. I noted earlier that the Flint water crisis brought public attention to environmental justice or, 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 or envi uh, water infrastructure as an environmental justice issue. Currently, there is no federal law that requires racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic equality in water infrastructure. Here are some graphs I did from yet another study with uh, David Switzer. On the vertical axis is poverty. On the horizontal, the percentage of the population on the left is, is black. On the, on the right is the Hispanic population uh, served by the utility. Again, red areas are high likelihood of violation. Blue areas, low likelihood of violation. The, uh, the results are pretty, pretty stark. Violations are most likely in places that are poor and non-white. We did this analysis in 2014, before the Flint water crisis. It got desk rejected by three major scientific journals because the editors told us it wasn't sufficiently interesting. <laughs> After the Flint water crisis, this study finally got published. But the most striking racial disparity in the United States in water is not in poor black or Hispanic communities. It's in Indian country. A few years ago, when I was doing all that analysis, I kept seeing this weird result for tribal systems. The, uh, the contamination violation figures were way, 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 way off the charts. They were way, way too high. And so I thought, we have a data error in here. I got one of my graduate students and I yelled at her and I said, this is a problem. Go figure out what's wrong with these data. We can, this is throwing our models all off. Figure out what's going on with these tribal systems. So she did. She went and investigated and she came back and it turns out we didn't have bad data. The problem wasn't with the data. The problem was with the utilities. The data were right. The problem was tribal water systems. After adjusting for wa other factors, we found that Clean Water Act violations are 23% higher. Safe Drinking Water Act violations are nearly 60% higher on tribal uh, lands compared with non-tribal facilities. That led us to take a deep dive into the politics and the processes of environmental regulation in Indian country. 
There's a lot going on in this graph. I could have given an entire talk just about the implications of, this, of these two graphs right here. But the, the, the punchline, the, the thing that I want to, to emphasize is that, that the biggest racial disparities in the United States with, with water quality are, are probably in Indian country. Remember this graph? So there's a lot of reasons for that. But remember this graph, the decline in federal funding for infrastructure? It turns out that American Indian facilities were not actually regulated under the Clean Water Act or the Safe Drinking Water Act until the late 1980s. What happened to federal funding in the late 1980s? It turns out that at the time that all that federal largesse was going out there, the tribal facilities weren't part of the Clean Water Act and were not part of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So they are a generation behind, 20 to 30 years behind in building both the organizations and the infrastructure necessary to do better with water. So my final proposal is to build environmental justice into federal water regulations. That means establishing metrics to measure disparities in environmental conditions and infrastructure investments, and it means extra funding and extra technical assistance to communities that have lagged behind because of structural and uh, structural problems, the most obvious example being uh, American Indian facilities. So that's the roadmap. I have a lot more ideas, but those are the big ones. As I indicated at the beginning of my talk, we are at an extraordinary moment, serious and sober people are talking about a trillion dollars for infrastructure, or two trillion dollars for infrastructure, with a lot of that going to water. But without institutional reform, all that federal money is just gonna kick these problems down a generation to our children and our grandchildren, and somebody's gonna be sitting here in 2070 giving the same talk I'm giving right now. That would be a failure. Systemic reform is possible. It's within reach. One of the most amazing things about the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, is when they were passed, nobody had any idea how any of it was going to work. Congress decided that the nation's water should be fishable and swimmable, that drinking water ought to be safe, but that the technology needed to do those things didn't exist in, in the early 1970s. Political scientists call that speculative augmentation, which is a very polite way of saying Congress had no idea what it was doing. <laughs> they just said, there's a public outcry, rivers are catching fire, people are getting sick, please go fix it. And amazingly, it basically worked. Politicians called for a cleaner environment and the scientific and engineering community responded. The late 20th century was an unprecedented period of advancement in water. It is nothing short of a triumph. 50 years ago, this spot on the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Today, people paddle their kayaks around there and they can eat the fish that come out of that river. The problems, if the problems were not too big then, they surely are not too big today. I say all this to drive the home the point that none of the reforms that I have proposed today is impossible. Every one of them is a change to a political institution or a regulation, not a change in technology. I'm not asking to change molecules. Public opinion consistently supports clean water across parties, across the ideological spectrum. We have, for all the wrong reasons in Flint, we have a once in a generation opportunity. I hope and pray that we will take advantage of it. Thank you, it's the end of my remarks. Thank you very much, Manny. That was fantastic. And um, I would like to just note quickly as a reminder that because we're working with our media partner at the Publix Radio, we'll have mics going up and down here. So if you raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. And please speak directly into the mic. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. I Thank want you. to comment that in the 1970s, I was one of those students who was funded to go to grad school by Here. EPA at URI and then Northeastern in Boston, and for 40 plus years have been working on all the problems you outlined. Excellent, class of 72. Uh, I was 74. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that old. <laughs> but the one issue to this day that worries me as much as any of the other issues you described, all of which I totally agree with, is the issue of a terrorist attack on our water systems. With so much technology being employed for some of the very reasons you pointed out, I'm actually amazed we haven't seen a serious terrorist attack on our water systems yet, and I wonder if you'd want to comment on that. Yeah, me too. 
I, I'm also surprised, and I'm also troubled. It's weird, I'm almost reluctant to talk about it in a public forum because these systems are so vulnerable. Uh, I almost don't, don't want to give anybody any ideas, right? Um, other than to say, yeah, it's a serious problem. I do know of some utilities that uh, post 9-11 made serious investments in security, hardening those systems, uh, building a, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of infrastructure to protect infrastructure. But that's another one where small systems have a hard time. And sometimes we're not even talking about really small. I'm talking about maybe medium-sized communities don't have the resources to put into serious hardening of their facilities. I know of at least one utility that, that's got something that looks like NORAD Command Center. Like it, it's a hardened bunker with real-time cameras and, and you know, inform, they're tracking social media and all kinds of stuff to, to do security. But not surprisingly, that's one of the biggest utilities in the country, right? I don't have a good answer for you on the, yeah, it's a serious problem and get another one that would be easier to solve if we had fewer systems. Yeah, I have um, two questions, uh, and I, they probably all have the same answer, but here in Rhode Island, our water supplies are highly vulnerable to climate change. A lot are on the coast, um, and rising seas are uh, imperiling those water supplies. So a comment on that. And then the second one is bottled water and sort of the privatization of all of our water and the industrial use of our drinking water. If you had some comments on those, that would be great. Thank you. OK. On, uh, on the vulnerability uh, from climate, I'm not a hydrologist, so I don't want to get out of my depth, so to speak. Uh, everybody laughed at that pun. <laughs> Come on. I'm doing my best dad jokes up here. Uh, on, on bottled water and privatization, you know, th this is really interesting. So, so privatization takes on several different forms in the water sector. There's privatization like a private company takes over a water system. That's one thing. But there's this question of, of, of bottled water or in, in my part of the country, down in Texas, there are water kiosks that are increasingly popular where you, you drive up to these freestanding uh, vending machines where people will fill up a, a five-gallon jerry can or something full of water. You see these sometimes in the back of supermarkets, Glacier or... or twice the ice or these kinds of companies. And it's fascinating. There's some interesting research that's come out about this stuff. Some of my own, some of uh, some folks at, at Penn State have, and, and uh, UCLA have done some interesting stuff on that. It turns out that bottled water consumption is the highest in poor and minority populations, which strikes people as backwards. We tend to think, in this country anyway, we think of bottled water as a luxury good because the unit cost of a bottle of Evian is a thousand times what comes out of the tap. And the difference is, of course, the tap water is subject to federal quality regulations. What comes in the bottle is not. So there's this paradoxical thing going on here. I, I don't have a, a, other a deeper comment other than to say I think that the, the proliferation of growth of, of private uh, water consumption in bottled and kiosk water says something about trust in our institutions. You know, it, it says something about uh, it says something powerful. If people are willing to spend uh, a thousand times more on on an unregulated product, then they are willing to buy what comes out of their tap. Right? So we we have a trust deficit, I think, in local uh, water systems in the United States. Um, you started off uh, mentioning that water supply systems are sort of built for forty to fifty year lifetimes. And that struck me from the beginning as, as uh, kind of a weak objective. Uh, is, are, are, there, are there better, longer term kind of solutions that can be made? Uh, or you know, why, why can't we do like the Romans did with their aqueducts? I love this question. Uh, one of the things when I, when I teach courses on environmental policy, I like to talk about a net present value analysis. And what's the right period of time to study a water system? What's the right time period to analyze a water system? And I actually use the example of Roman aqueducts, some of which are still delivering water. They were built 17, 1800 years ago and are still delivering water to cities in Europe. Uh, yeah, we should do better. We can do better. And, and to be fair, a lot of our systems that, that are supposedly built to a 40 or 50 year lifespan, some, some elements of those systems are still operating fine. In general, our supply works tend to work better than our distribution works. The, the quality of, of, of engineering and, and infrastructure is better. I want to be careful. I'm not an engineer, just like I'm not a hydrologist. Uh, but yeah, when, when we 
chart out these systems, when engineers develop proposals for development and investment in water systems, they usually use a 40 or 50 year lifespan. And not surprisingly, that's tied to the funding cycles. Right? That's usually a 20 or 30 year bond uh, payment plus an assumed 20 to 30 year replacement cycle. Uh, and we usually pr do a pretty good job with the bond funding. It's the replacement cycle part that doesn't end up happening. So yes, we, we can and should do better. Uh, in both, both analytically, we need to widen our, our frame. We need to start making decisions that, that recognize that these systems are legacy systems in the real sense of that word. They're legacies that we bequeath to our children and grandchildren. We should be making investments in water that, that transcend generations. Hi, great talk. Um, so I just I have a few observations from Rhode Island um, where there's a few departures in um, kind of the things that you laid out. Um, so in Rhode Island, we have just one public, one private water system, public water system that serves a large um, community. In fact, it's just uh, in the next town over in, in Wakefield. Um, and then we have um, four uh, intergovernor, intergovernmental water authorities that are actually, so we have, I think it's four or five um, water authorities that span multiple municipalities and all of those are regulated under PUC. So we actually are somewhat unique in that the majority of the population in Rhode Island is, is um, served by a utility that is under PUC regulation. Um, and we have good uh, water, I'm talking about water supply now, drinking water, not other, not the other water, pipes. Um, but the, um, we have a, a, like a water infrastructure um, planning requirement for our municipal water systems. Um, and we have this water supply system management planning. So in essence, we have like these great plans that lay out, you know, they really treat the system as an asset have you know replacement plans um, and yet we still have problems um, with you know lack of uh, enough funding to actually implement those and I think the biggest issue that is facing the state from a, um, a public water supply system perspective is that something like 75 percent of the population is serviced by a system that's owned by the city of Providence um, that has completely under um, funded the kind of infrastructure improvements. So like the lead service connections that you cited, you know, that's a service connection issue. It's not necessarily a big pipe problem. Um, they, um, they, at one point, there there have been several legislative bills put forward that would um, look to sell the public, the Providence water supply um, to a private or someone who would be willing to pay for it in a way that bails, could then be used to bail out the city's um, pension problem. Um, and the thing that strikes me is that it's coming from the same pocket. It's the people who are the customers um, are the ones who are paying for it, whether it's Providence Water who is uh, managing the system or some other authority. And I just, I would be interested in your thoughts about that, about, you know, how, how do we end up, because I absolutely agree with everything you said about consolidation and, and um, need for asset management, but there are these management entities that are managing the system, and if they, you know, aren't doing a good job or they're too small and they need to get bigger, it's, again, it's still all of us who are paying it. We're the ones who own it and it's coming out of our pocket. How do we like make sure that we, the people, are not getting completely uh, screwed? <laughs> Be careful, this is a public radio. I was trying to think of a good word, but. Can you not, summarize yeah. that when you were speaking? Wow, you said a lot. Um, and it's so weird, I'm sort of, as you're speaking, I'm ticking through my entire research agenda. These are all issues that I look at. Um, so I, I could say a lot. So. Um, First of all, thank you for letting me know about, about these public sector entities that are regulated in, in, um, in Rhode Island. Uh, in the state of Indiana is similar. There are a handful of public sector. But Wisconsin is the only one where everyone's required, public and, and private both. Um, you know, I, I've got, a, I've got a, a big research agenda, a project going with David Kaniski at, the, at, at Indiana University. Gail mentioned this forthcoming book where we're looking at the dynamics of governments regulating other governments. So we, we can. State governments can pass rules that say you got to do asset management, you got to reinvest. The, ha the real question is what happens when they don't? Okay. 
I can force you to make a plan, but I can't necessarily force you to fund it. And that is because uh, of the third point that you raised, which is that the money's all coming from the same people in the end. Right, there's, I, I'm, I'm glad you told me the story about Providence because it, it, it mirrors what we see in a lot of communities around the United States. People see this backlog in, in water infrastructure investment and that infrastructure starts to look like maybe a cash cow because you can bring in a private investor or some other entity to give your city out hundreds of millions, maybe a billion dollars to buy the system. And hot diggity, that looks like a whole great big windfall. Well, the money's coming from the same people in the end. You're going to pay your local government, you're going to pay some kind of a water authority, or you're going to pay a private utility. Either way, you're going to pay. Or, by the, or you could just let it fail, in which case you're going to pay with your health. Either way, no matter what you do, you're going to pay. So yeah, not, the, the reason that it's so difficult to, to get one government agency to force another government agency to do something is like, you have to think about this realistically. If you're an environmental regulator, and say Providence is under investing in its system, you go to Providence and say, Providence, you're not investing enough in your system. You better fix that or, or else. And they're going to say, or else what? <laughs> you can't put the city of Providence out of business. That's not a realistic alternative. You can find them. But you're not finding the managers and the elected officials. You're going to find the utilities. So you're just finding the very people who are suffering already with poor water quality. So yeah, we should not think of privatization. Privatization, there's a lot of good arguments for privatization. In fact, I've made some. But one really bad argument for privatization is this free money, right? Free money from the private sector. No, there's no, there's no free money from the private sector. That's not, gonna, that's not how any of this works. So, so you raise really important points. Um, the last thing I'll say on service lines uh, connections, the lead service line versus the water mains and the distribution system. Uh, as recently as five or six years ago, before Flint, there's another thing that's changed the water sector. Five, six years ago, it was gospel in the water sector that, look, the water utility owns everything up to the meter. Everything on the other side of the meter belongs to the customer. It's the customer's problem. It's the homeowner's problem. It's not good enough anymore. There's been a, a paradigm change in the water sector, we now recognize that if there's a lead service line or lead soldering, some kind of a lead problem within the home, that's still a public health concern. And so utilities are, are struggling with it. It's a, a terribly expensive problem. And it also is one that involves privacy, government officials coming into your home to do inspections and this sort of things. It's, it's a very difficult public policy problem, and the folks in Providence are struggling with that.